Hello, I'm Andy Terrell. I'm here to talk to you a little bit about model review and kind of my, my journey of taking a model from exploration to production. Um, you'll be able to find more of my uh, details of my talk over on the uh, uh, this GitHub uh, link, a Terrell slash model review talk, where you'll have the Jupyter notebook and an example uh, model review notebook and a few other things. I'd like to thank some of my um, co-authors in this. Um, Andy Maloney and John Hanley uh, provided a lot of material I'm presenting today. And then the Rex Data team has been gracious enough to, to deal with <clears throat> me uh, pestering them and getting their feedback. Um, I'm, like I said, I'm Andy Terrell. I'm the chief data scientist at Rex. I'm also the president of NumFocus, an organization dedicated to helping the PyData ecosystem um, both thrive and uh, survive. All right, with that said, let's get into the talk. So your model is done. You're ready to explore the bright blue ocean in front of you. You've built this perfectly wonderful uh, uh, ship. This, is, I think in this case, is a, a reconstruction of an old ancient ship, and you're going to go and, and prove to the world your worth. But do you really know what's ahead of you? Have you done this before? What is going to happen at this point? What's out there in that blue ocean? And that's where we want to start. That's the perspective we want to take today. We're not necessarily in this particular talk going to go through all the techniques you use to, to build a model or all the, the like cutting the corner or explainability or all those details, which are really awesome. I'm really concerned with your model's done. Um, how the heck am I going to sail it across the ocean? So the other view of this is if you're handing your off model off to somebody else, what do I expect you to know once you give me the model? Okay. First off, there was this great paper by the, some folks at Google and NeuroIPS in 2015 on the hidden technical debt in machine learning systems. And you notice here that the ML code is that really small part in the middle there. This is a little black box. And this picture gets shown all over the place. And I think it really shows kind of the, the, the challenge that uh, modelers actually have in that all, everyone talks about the modeling. We love the detail of modeling, but to actually build a full system, you have a lot more resources going into the, the ecosystem. I liken it to the body, right? Like you have a brain. It's not as big as, you know, the rest of your body. Um, you have a heart as well that has to has to beat in order for you to your system to, to survive. The same with ML code. It's whether it's your brain or your heart, you need it to, go, to work, but it's not the only system to actually be functional. So let's dive into a little bit about knowing some of these things. In order to do so, let's chart our journey. We're going to understand a little bit about deploying models and how they are used in different production environments. Uh, we're going to track how to track data into and out of your model. I think something that I see a lot is people um, will assume that they have perfect data coming into their model and assume that the thing coming out of their data will be perfect, which is rarely the case in, in practice. And then we say, how do you detect problems with your model, especially if you're detecting them in, um, in situ in, as it happens in the, in the world? Um, and then we'll put it together a checklist so that you can kind of dive into it after the talk and, and kind of understand and, and maybe apply it to your own teams. All right. Straight away, you gave me this beautiful handcrafted model that was perfect recreation of something, and I'm going to put it in a box. <laughs> That's right. We're going to containerize it. And just like you put, you know, ancient items and all sorts of wonderful things into these boxes on ships, it protects them and puts them in in the um, the cargo hold, and everybody doesn't. It's safe, and but nobody has to know anything about it. Well, that works sometimes, but models are a little bit different than just 12 factor apps that are, have all their configuration and can be deployed anywhere. So let's go through some of those differences and just realize from like the operation standpoint, they like shipping boxes. They don't really want to ship your un, uh, your handcrafted model. They, they just want give me the square box I can stack and, and then get across the ocean. So how do we come together with that? Well, first I'll just talk about data collection because I think that's like the first thing that's way different than your mo most of your applications that are deployed. Um, how are you 
defining your data sources. I think I see these, uh, these, these shipping containers that have like, you can hook up water and electricity. You better be darn right that they they want, they have potable water and non potable water is going to be hooked up to it. They're going to have the type of electricity, whether it's two twenty volts or one twenty volts or whatever it is. There's some specification for hooking these things up to like the life support system. And the same thing exists in your model. Are you hooking up to some like an application database or the pain of my my uh, behind is the customer relations management records. All those things where the salespeople enter details all day. And of course, there's never any errors in that data. I mean, humans are, are perfect, right? Um, or then there's maybe the even something I hate even more is a web analytic events where it's like, oh, tell us exactly what happened on your website so we can optimize every last eyeball that ever, ever came. All those things are great. They come in different formats and different ways of thinking. And you have to have some contract that that gives you an idea of where this data is coming from. I like to talk about that in the relevance of, of data provenance. Um, pardon the rendering here. So provenance is basically... Um, you showing the entity activity and agent relationship inside your model. And here's a, 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 a nice tutorial from Dong Huan. Um, on the, if you go to his uh, Prov Python short tutorial, and here in this case, he wants to show the data and the person who developed an article. So we have this article now employed, um, an employment article V1. It it was written by um, this person who was attributed, uh, Bob, and it was uh, using this uh, OES. OESEM 11 ST zip file, which has the prov type of data set and a label of employment status. So, yeah, it's a little clunky to like kind of read, but you can use prov and the Python, great Python prov tools to, to build up data sets. And in, in some of my code, I'm not going to show it here, but what I'll end up doing is I'll have a whole bunch of data sets, especially as they are. I used ETL on different data sets. I can track back to what transform, what um, extraction methods did I use to get to that data set. And so getting that provenance and like entities, activities and agents together to actually show um, how your data came about. And that way um, you also inside you can from my data set, if I see my source came through with IP addresses and at some point I strip those out with unique identifiers to anonymize them, I can go back and see what piece of code or what uh, item was actually doing that. And then I can also audit, make sure it does happen because you, you don't want to keep privacy in your ecosystem. And having provenance is a really good way to automatically generate these contracts and also show the world what data is coming to your model. Um, just kind of reiterate the entity, any physical digital concept, activity, something that occurs. Often the activity is like my script. So the entity will be my script. The activity will be like some pro processing team. And the agent's usually the person who's responsible for that code, whether it's my team or whether it's uh, some other team. Uh, but, but generally, that's kind of they fall into my, my ecosystem. All right. So now you need, you build this model. Um, and you did all the provenance, you extracted the data, but you need to test what's coming in. Just because you have it described doesn't mean like it's actually what's going to happen. So like you test your contract. And so one thing that's really interesting to me is like we find all of these wonderful features about a model, such as the range, the distribution, some sensitivity factors, but then we throw it away in production. <laughs> I mean, often you'll see people just like, oh yeah, I'll just take some, some function and just take whatever it says and like predict back. And like this is like, oh, you know, warning. If you don't know where your model's in, and out of sample, you can get into big errors. And if your model gets used incorrectly, um, you're you're really doing a disservice. And that communication of what is in and out of a sample can be done through just you know simple scripts of throwing an exception or an error if it gets called in the right way, and you know what these things are. So encapsulate those range of features and those um, sensitivity measures. Though. So, and additionally, when we talk a little bit about monitoring systems, you can then encode these even further up and have a way of having the monitor check, am I actually in sample? Did I ever go out of sample in my last week of run? And so on and so forth.
Uh, the other thing you kind of need to take in advance when you're like producing a model and you're reviewing a model is how is this model going to be called? There's different ways, different people use them. I'll go through a, a few uh, kind of common idioms here in a minute. But the way you get called also will define your SLA. So if you're being called on an e-commerce website, for example, and you're in the checkout flow, I guarantee you, you will not have... A, 20 seconds to answer your question uh, now you might you might not you might have more than you would in a finance world where you only have eight milliseconds maybe on uh, a, a digital trading platform but you don't but you you have to kind of figure out what is the right approach uh, i think that typically you know in some numbers to keep in your head you know 37 milliseconds is a refresh rate on your computer uh the 150 milliseconds is usually the the, the time you need to respond to a web web uh request to, to stay active on the page um but then eight seconds is um what you might need if you were actually um before the the user leaves so if you're going to do some sort of scrolling thing you actually can have a little bit more so the interactivity versus um scrolling and then if you're like can't meet those requirements how do you get to something that's more of a back-end serving mechanism or something and then how do you monitor all this how do you know that you're actually hitting all this so you need to put that in the model like wh what what are the points that i'm going to benchmark against and where and how do i know that i'm hitting those points usually through some sort of logging Okay, so how do you get called? This is a great kind of book, uh, Software Architecture Pattern from Mark Richards, a nice little thin book from O'Reilly. And I love giving this to my new, uh, new hires just to give them a sense of what's going to happen to uh, their model in production. Now, this is just one of the, the many things in here, but this is your, your standard client server request pattern. I have a bunch of clients, web browsers typically, if you're in an API, uh, they have some interface, usually HTTP. Um, and then there's some like, for example, protocol, in this case, he says REST, gRPC is a great protocol, uh, GraphQL is another protocol, a lot of different protocols these days. Um, and then you have your service components, and then the, inside the service components are the different little modules. The way I usually build models, like my model is one of those modules. Um, but you could imagine using a whole model server and it being the rest piece in the, the server component. And so, so knowing how you're going to get called will inform this. Now, in this case, like if you're a user interface layer using REST and you have an eight, an eight minute response, you have to know that most uh, clients, uh, web browsers are not going to keep keep the connection open for eight minutes. Um, sometimes you you catch different places that might do something, but there are like built in timeouts on the internet that cause you to to lose those requests and so forth. So right away, if I'm in this paradigm, I might have two minutes to respond on the average request uh, for, or the average browser. Um, but really, in actuality, it should be more than like 150 millisecond uh, range, 400 milliseconds in order to be what people expect as a responsive web page. All right. The other place you might get called is another really common architecture. And this is from a figure from MapR that details the Lambda architecture, which is a, a really standard architecture you see in a lot of places. And in this architecture, you have three different layers. You have the batch layer here at the top, which is really your Hadoop. And you can do things slowly, but you can do it all night. You can you're you're taking in a large data data um, lake or, or data bank, which whichever word you like. Um, and you're computing things on that in a batch mode. So if it takes an hour to, to run your, your job, it's probably OK. Um, but you always have to worry about scaling and things like that. So in this case, you're, you're running lots of things on a job. And so you're getting called with with much more than just one data point. So it's not like I get one data item come out. So your model can maybe it can do multiple batches. Maybe it can do um, a prediction on a, a larger frame and then it speeds things up. So in that that bachelor environment, you really changes some of your prediction behaviors and, um, and you can take advantage of that in different ways. Um, then we have the serving layer, which is really kind of the layer that's actually um, being um, going to be called during the, the um, either the web ad, web view or the on sir on um, a real time view that happens during the, the, the application. Um, and then 
that you can, and that's where we could use the other paradigm is the client review quest, or you could just grab the data out of the uh, aggregated batch view somehow. Um, and then you have your speed layer, which is really just like very simple aggregation type data. Um, a good example is in ad, ad targeting, you might have uh, some counters that tell you do I am I frequency capping this user? So you just have like an ID and the number of times you've shown um, some display ad to a person uh, and, and go from there. So really in this, your model can land in any one of these layers and the way it gets called can, can actually impact the type of methods you can use. So the speed layer, you're not going to be able to do um, you know, deep learning, for example. Uh, the batch layer, you can take advantage of those, the, the, the multiple prediction aspects of it. You can do things like matrix factorization and keep that factors um, all across a very large view. So it just kind of changes the nature of how you're being called. You need to kind of put that into your specification of your model and, and kind of the, the objectives that you have. Okay, so here's like an example from, from that I deployed at one point, which is like on my node, what do I actually have to model? And so even though I have the model here, like I still have several things going on inside my instance. And in here you see I have a load balancer going to a gateway instance going to my data model. And you, we do that so that the gateway can take care of like all the kind of different crux and, and challenges that might come through the model, do such as rate limiting, such as user login, credentials, things like that. And then we can have the data model separated in this lower box. And even in there, we we throw on like a some web servers and proxies in order to make sure that the data coming to the model is actually the right data. Um, and inside of that, we're talking to things like RDS, which we'll maybe put in our, our calculators for our cache so that you don't actually go call the model. Or and then in top, on top of that, all the logs will go up to this box at the top with the paper trail, which is our logger. Uh, and we have our little other red boxes here. It says run scope, which is the pinger, making sure that our model is still calling. So having some little health check or something that says, yes, this model is still producing the right data um, is great by using something like health run scope. One trick I've always used in the past is to just run my, uh, my different, uh, just record what's come in and out through that RDS and just run rerun it and see if, if things are changing on my model. Uh, often, because the data is coming in from different sources, it very, sometimes you'll end up uh, with some some movement in your model and you can uh, find that out by just replaying uh, old old requests and whatnot. Uh, then I have things like SynGrid, which will email me if something's going really wrong, and Rollbar, which is a, a system that will capture errors as Sentry is another good example and it'll categorize all the errors that happen in the code. So even in that model, like there's a lot of different things. I'm capturing errors, I'm capturing logs, I'm capturing um, the, the model um, output coming through and, and I'm actively pinging the thing to make sure that it's doing the right thing and, and checking its temperature. So all those things really help. But then you're out in the wild and you say like, how did I get here? <laughs> you're being handled the model and that person needed to give you some details and, and know that you're actually no longer in that handcrafted boat reconstruction from the 18th century. You're actually in uh, an icing vessel studying the climates. Uh, so very, very different idea. Still a boat, still floats, still has uh, all kinds of sorts of bells and whistles, but you kind of need to know what environment you're going to be in. So how do we do this in practice? How do we get there? So we usually build our data sets through these extract transform load objects and i'm just going to briefly go over a few of them and then i'll show you uh, a uh, um, a fuller kind of uh, rubric that we use in our um, notebooks um so we so this is, so we have like an extractor and in this extractor you have different types of extracts um and so we, we actually do this kind of registration protocol where i can um just call an extract on anything and all you have to do is implement this underscore extract um and i can kind of build data sets from all sorts of different types of extractors i built same thing with transformers um maybe i should 
So in a transformer, it's just taking that data from one form to another, whereas the extractor is, is maybe pulling out some elements of that data. And finally, we have the load, uh, which is loading it into the final form that will be used for whatever modeling um, piece I want. And so in that, we use this nice pattern, this shadow pattern that that kind of helps us along. Then here's an example of a data set where we have a whole bunch of different um, kind of pieces of like, where is the data at? How is it, you know, how's it stored and, and so on and so forth. And then this is uh, another coin where the underscore load method will call those load, which we'll call the transform extract kind of function. So we have a nice chain that tells us all the different places that data came from. And we can actually pull off a, a W3C prov um, piece from that. Um, often, this is very common, you want to add some sort of caching layer to your data. Um, how you add that data, whether it's locally, remotely, kind of kind of think through that and, and we, we extract that into our, to our uh, data frame at the highest level. Um, and we, we can often override kind of how our data set will load because sometimes you have something maybe a little bit ch uh, challenging to work through like, oh, Google Analytics has, can only get so many requests a day, so we're going to batch this over several days and then and then maybe we'll call the API or call our, um, our our local copy or something like that. So you can kind of greatly make that your life very simple by using things like these shadow functions or whatnot. All right. So uh, here's, an, and here's just an example of an extractor, an iris data, which we all love, a nice example that, that you can kind of play with. And in here, we just say load iris, which is kind of your standard um, thing, scikit-learn function there. And in this, for example, we wanted to only take um, a certain number of uh, certain columns, the feature names that we care about, and we want to turn them into like the iris name, perhaps instead of calling it feature name, let's call it iris name and make it a little bit easier to use as a uh, piece of cut as a as an example. So this is another example. So take the iris data set, extracting it, which was just loading it from a function in second learn. Uh, changing out like which labels we're using um, and then turning that into the actual um, pandas data frame that we will use in in model um, yeah and so and here's an example of that being being up all right so we just went through how like what we expect to see an extract load model um, and using a, a few tricks of the trade. But what am I going to when I'm going to review your model? What am I looking for? The biggest one, first thing I want to see is like, have you written down your meta model? Do I have an objective? Do I have a sentence or two that tells me what your model aims at? Because just because it's in code, like it doesn't always translate super well. <laughs> I mean, I'm looking for KPIs, like predict what the model predicts, what further actions I need to take uh, to acquire that data out of sample predictions that show um, what what would happen in an out of sample prediction and like how it lines up and then maybe if there's an outlier um, and how do it, how does outliers work inside my model uh, I expect you to tell me those inputs just like I did that and the, use that provenance uh, extract transform load um, also can I reproduce that do I have uh, in an s3 bucket or, or some other sort of storage spot that I can get to and, and so forth I expect you to tell me where my outputs will go will it be just be local will it be standard is it just a, uh, a, a request object um, and should I be worried about rose overriding some frozen output <laughs> Next, I want to like, you know, what are my assumptions about this model? Like, you know, this, I have a, a computer vision model that sees faces, but only in the wintertime at ski resorts. Very different model than uh, some of the sees only faces at a, a beach. Um, big, big glasses big, make a big difference. Uh, <laughs> then, you know, what are some of the most common violations? Assuming the model is independent or they aren't independent. How can I define some of those distributions and do they hold in practice and then observe data? Then like we talked about, my SLA was determined about where I was running, make an actual benchmark. Uh, I, you know, I always love this WRK library that is, lets you specify how often you're calling something and just test, can I keep this up on, a, on my server and, and so forth. Is it the best available? Is there better uh, models um, or better ways to make it faster? Things like that. Like you can put it down the model. Like I didn't make this faster because I don't really need uh, to be a eight millisecond. So I, I kept it in Python. I didn't use Numba, that sort of thing. Um, 
I think that this is one that's really challenging as well. It's like you need to have learning curves and show what is happening. Are you overfitting? Do you get do you get too quickly to an answer, um, or does it? Or did you end up putting? Or did your data, I guess, too quickly to an answer is not really what we want. We feel like we show that there's uh, a very long time to learn. Like that, okay, your chances of overfitting are pretty great. If it's very, it's very short, then um, you, you learn the concept in a very small number of samples, then that's a, a much better place to be. You can kind of like show how the different methods you used have went through that variance. Um, and then you can observe it in practice, like which, how, how well am I doing on those tests? Like when I get in my, um, uh, how my model's actually being called in practice in those recordings and that, for example, that RDS database, I just run it back over those uh, samples and see how well my learning and test curves actually work on the things that are inside the, the actual um, uh, deployed model. Then also, like we mentioned, show us all your transforms. Show us how you're filtering, your missing attributes. Uh, imputation, I think, is another one a lot of people don't talk about a lot. Like imputation can change your um, model by a lot. And we'll show a little demo if we have time. Um, and it's important to kind of put that to use. Okay, so inside the repo, I have kind of a state, like our standard. Um, uh, version of this rubric. Um, you can see here I have a title and objectives and some notebook uh, pieces, some details on the data set generation and all this code that we kind of just talked over. Um, I really look for, for someone to show me their exploration of this data, to show me the, the thing that actually they think this data is going to show tell us. Um, and I love to use Seaboard for this. The pair plots really give me separators. If I can get a nice separator there, it um, I can tell you like right away, like, okay, I have a shot with these sets of features. In this case, with the Iris data set, you can see sepal length versus sepal width. And you can see very quickly that there's um, some separation in petal length versus sepal length right here. Um, and then perhaps there's more separation over here between pedal length and pedal width on some of these other uh, some of the other irises so using these you can get an intuition of like what's going on for your, your traditional models um, you can also see there's a lot of other graphs such as joint plots um, joint distributions uh, and, and so on and so forth and so in here kind of pick and choose. We just put a lot in here to kind of show the, the different ideas of what you need to show about your data. We love to use Boca in our uh, in our systems. It's a little bit more code to do everything you want, but at the end of the day, like I will put, um, uh, well, unfortunately, uh, I will put Boca inside and have a nice interactive plot. And unfortunately it didn't show up here, but um, we'll, we'll have it, you can execute it and you have a nice interactive plot. Um, statistics is another great place as your data comes in you have some fairly simple statistical uh, kind of uh, measures such as your means and your distributions your max um, that you can kind of measure not only on the data you created but this is where you're going to get uh, the ranges that I expect to see inside like maybe the methods that um, you check the, the the call to my data. So instead of just calling the model directly with the data, I'll check to make sure that, hey, is it actually within this distribution? If I'm coming in and have some sepal length that's like nine <laughs> inches, nine centimeters long, uh, probably not the right, uh, right model for this. Um, but that can be, by using such as this describe and getting uh, those samples out, I can put that directly into the the function that's going to be calling that model, or I can put it into some wrapper in that model that, that checks all the inputs and outputs. Um, yeah, confusion matrix are great. Profiling, uh, another thing that didn't show up on this screen, but pandas profiling is really great. It shows you all sorts of like what's missing and, and whatnot. Um, the, the, the next kind of piece I think is really important is missing profiling your missing data because inevitably you will have data that is missing. You will have data that's not going to show up inside your um, your environment for whatever reason. Uh, and you need to be able to handle that. So here we go through a, a few like major imputation type uh, fields um, and some papers that kind of show like what happened, how to like uh, 
handle the different imputation. But the, one of the, the biggest tricks we did first do is like, we just build a little routine that um, here that comes through and just delete some data for you. Um, so, all right, so I, I deleted my data. Now I can come through and profile it again and do all the same uh, distribution plot. So you can see up above, I had this nice rich implementation and here's like all the missing data. And you see these things look vastly different. Like my separator up here between sepal length and sepal width is just gone. Um, I still have one here with petal length and sepal length. So even in that, like by taking a little bit of a caution of like, all right, can I delete some of your data? Can I change it up um, and see how the distributions change? And then I can come back. And so, and here's the the um, the actual the, the the full data plot for your example again. Um, but then, if I come and use different imputers, what happens? You can see right here that when I impute from this uh, sepal width versus sepal length, and I come with just a simple imputation my separators are all kind of all sorts of janky, right? So that's gonna to happen to you in production. So how is my data gonna change? Uh, and being able to just build a few of these little utility functions to, to test this very quickly is very, very great. A really great system um, to kind of play with. And you certainly can automate all of this um, once you kind of figure out the modes of your, how your model works. Uh, we like to use pictures just to kind of get us. And so there's some other things, K neighbors, uh, convex, uh, convex uh, optimization, and so on and so forth, soft imputation, which is pretty popular. Um, and then we just go through our model, our, our you know building our model with data, with, with missing data, with imputed data. Show me all of the different ways that I can kind of play with your model. And so this is, don't have to do all of these every time, but it's just kind of a, a way to kind of show it off. And, what hyperparameters did I actually tune to? Can I actually bring out those hyperparameters? And eventually I get down to my learning curve so I really wanna see how well did that um, actually, actually so out of like 120 samples, we really got to the crux of like our, uh, most of our learning done through half. That's a pretty good learning curve. Um, but you can kind of go back and forth. And then there's confusion matrix obviously and so forth. All right, so that was, showing our data prep, showing like all the different pieces and playing around with the imputation and so forth. Um, and you'll be able to find that in the repo. All right, so I'm gonna skip this review checklist um, in the interest of time and just talk a little bit about, all right, we went through all the details. Um, you can go to the repo and see the, the full on checklist of every item we just went through. Um, but what happens when it's down? Oh my goodness, everything is going to heck. I don't know you know, are we stranded or are we going to be sailing again someday soon? Um, well, that's where the, the product, the, the product folks or the, uh, the ops folks can really help you as a, a modeler in here. Like you saw this, like we saw the, the, the system that was built that showed us all those little monitoring pieces, but then your, your ops folks will have systems like this, and this was a, a system that I worked on in the past, where my model is buried deep in this API over here, and then on the other side of this, I had just you know a services around this, such as dashboards and demos and and so on to kind of play with it. I had an async tax queue. I love to use like Kafka type um, introspection. So if I have something that's like coming off and it needs more like asynchronous uh, execution, I can just tap into Kafka and see what you know what happened over the last week, um, and I can rerun that data, and, and it gives you a nice way to say, all right, it was down. Oh, I can see that all of a sudden we were out of sample and we can see where we start getting out of sample. We need to add something to, to uh, check that in the API, for example. I can also see you know, my data, um, kind of get into your database and, and understand what's happening there. I usually, you know, kind of keeping both a Redis hot cache for, and your database in the background, which is your uh, source of truth perhaps that helps you kind of know what's being written to and, and read from and separating those things out but in getting those caches versus the the uh, standard layers usually there and then on monitoring it, it, it's funny i always find that every system i've ever built has more monitoring tools than it actually has tools being <laughs> used sometimes so everything from like your log aggregation to a notification system so if something goes down to that polling we talked about with the uh, um, run scope and all these have nice interfaces you can get into to um, and understand. So you're down, but by building all these elements and showing your ops folks what 
is required to make your model work, they can build in all of these other systems to help you whenever it goes down to debug what what the what's going on in the model. And you, you certainly learn things about the the real world that you didn't have in your training data once you put a model, model live. Um, another popular trend that you should consider is using um, a, a model server like Bento, MLflow, Redis AI, and a whole bunch of uh, industry ones have all kind of come up. And these take away a lot of the some of the pain of the, the metrics gathering and tracking and, and keeping your latest model up to date and things like that. Um, but of course, like your mileage will vary depending on what your SLA can be and, and so on and so forth. So it's kind of a, a investigate each one and, and kind of understand what they provide for you. All right. That's that's it. We went through a model. We reviewed it. We uh, debugged some problems. We looked at how the logging system, uh, logging and monitoring systems can be used inside of it. We have some uh, some rubrics and notebooks that you can like look at afterwards um, this talk. And I hope you had a good time and you your fleet of models can be um, deployed at any time and ready to uh, use in production. Um, thank you very much.